Welcome to this masterclass in architecture. My name is Roar Julien. I'm a lecturer at the University of East London. And this masterclass is about architecture and climate change. First, we'll uh, go through a simple introduction to climate change, and then we'll discuss some of the work that the UEL students are doing uh, in relation to climate change and how they're tackling climate change in their projects. First of all, what's climate change? So climate change is a large scale long shift in the planet's weather. It's also referred to as global warming. The largest human influence has been the emission of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. Human activity since the Industrial Revolution has increased the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and in particular from the burning of fossil fuels such as coal, oil and natural gas. A buildings cause a lot of greenhouse gases. In fact, uh, in the UK, buildings cause 42 percent of carbon emissions um, of, the, of the entire country. So this is quite a lot. And buildings cause CO2 emissions through their use of energy. Energy is used in the construction. So first of all, when materials are being extracted, when materials are being manufactured, uh, when they're transported and on the construction site. All of this together is using energy and this energy is called embodied energy. So we talk about embodied energy and embodied CO2, which is the CO2 emissions arising from the energy use of the building's materials and its construction. Buildings also use energy when they are in operation. We call this the operational energy of the building. So that includes the heating of the building, the, its cooling, uh, cooking in the building, for example, and even the electricity used uh, in the building from appliances, devices, and lighting. Finally, buildings also emit CO2 through the demolition of the buildings themselves and through the transportation and disposal of the building's materials. So buildings use energy and consequently emit CO2 throughout their life cycle. So this is causing the increase of the greenhouse layer. When um, the energy from the sun reaches the earth, it can be reflected into space or absorbed by the surface of the earth. But most of the heat is trapped by a blanket of greenhouse gases. And climate change is due to an effect called the greenhouse effect, which is that this blanket is effectively increasing and keeping the earth warmer. And this effect is being measured, and this is a picture from uh, the NASA, which is showing the anomaly of temperature, how much the temperature has increased on the globe. And you can see that in most parts of the globe, the temperature of the Earth is increasing. So if we're looking at the average temperature for each decade, it is very obvious that the temperature is increasing uh, since the Industrial Revolution here. And we know that this is because of us, it's because of people. This is due to the increased uh, CO2 emissions from essentially the burning of fossil fuel, other things as well, but this is the main reason. We have increased the amount of CO2 by more than half by now. And we are sure that humans are causing uh, global warming and climate change. In 2013, there was a review of over 4,000 academic papers, and 90% of these academic papers said that humans are causing climate change and global warming. But what's the big deal? You know, maybe it's just be a little bit warmer and we can spend more time on the beach. No, that's not really. Uh, the case. The issue is that the weather is going crazy. We have more and more storms, we have more and more floods and landslides uh, due to changes in the rainfall and also due to the fact that the sea is inflating due to its increased temperature and there's more and more droughts and heat waves and forest fires. For example, last year in India, the temperature reached over 50 degrees. It was nearly 51, which is actually very dangerous for human health. 
in Australia, the heat waves were so strong that 20,000 uh, fruit bats fell from the sky. And there was widespread wildfires which endangered uh, human life, but also really harmed the ecosystems. There's also problems with water stress and droughts throughout the world, and this is increasing. Kenya, for example, suffered extensive droughts last year towards the end of the year, which also caused famine combined with the ongoing conflict there. And then following this, they uh, endured extreme rainfalls for two months, which, called in some, which caused in some parts some floods. Um, there was also very big storms like the Typhoon Akibis in October 2019, which occurred in Japan and caused destruction across its path. Uh, and then there's ongoing problems like the rising sea in the Mekong Delta. This is in uh, Vietnam. The seawater sea rising is destroying crops and causing problems of hunger and displacement of people, um, as well as severe floods, problems with droughts and dengue. There's been exceptional monsoon floods in Nepal, India and Bangladesh, which again is displaced many people and caused the death uh, of hundreds of people. And this is not something that is not affecting us. In the UK, we have more and more floods as well. And this map here is issued from a research in the academic journal Nature and is showing the water level in 2050 in red here. And you can see that the water levels are projected to uh, increase substantially and could pose a threat to many households in the UK. Climate change is also disrupting biodiversity. This is a major issue because it's causing suitability loss for agriculture. So uh, it's threatening of food production in many areas of the world. In addition, there are other problems like the displacement of some insects, like the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes can be a bad thing. Uh, for example, this uh, mosquito here is the tiger mosquito, which is a uh, vector for the transmission of pathogens like the yellow fever and dengue fever. And um, this mosquito is reaching France and will probably reach the UK very soon. Finally, another issue is that the permafrost is melting. This is a big problem because th there are areas in the north where, um, which are permanently frozen or at least for several years in a, in a row should be frozen. This is melting. This is causing for roads and buildings to collapse effectively because what is normally hardened frozen floor is melting but more importantly and also importantly this is releasing some gases such as nitrous oxide and this is a very powerful greenhouse gas which is accelerating climate change so this is a sort of thing that is quite threatening and dangerous so what can you do if you are an aspiring architect you can just ignore this problem so first of all, you need to be a green architect. You need to design green, zero carbon buildings. You need to design buildings which are going to be resilient to climate change, which are going to be designed to respond to climate change in a way which is sustainable and good for the environment. Um, you will need to think about how you can innovate. And you also need to be an activist. You need to take position through your work and through your designs um, to prevent climate change, um, as well as to respond to it. The good news is that we can change this. From a technical point of view, we can. Uh, we have the technical means to tackle climate change. And for example, renewable energy such as solar and wind energy is becoming increasingly cheap. And in fact, is competing against fossil fuels in terms of uh, their economical viability. In addition to this, many organizations are declaring a climate emergency. This includes half of the UK's local authorities, the UK government, the London, London's Myers, and the Royal Institute of British Architects. So now I will present you some of the work that the students here at the IUEL are doing to respond to the climate emergency. 
So first of all, Nurea presented a project which provides a complex of gardens together with a centre for horticultural and permacultural education in East Ham, uh, which is in London. So the project reuses existing buildings. This is very important. As I said earlier, the, the construction of buildings and their materials causes CO2 emission. And so keeping existing buildings rather than constructing new ones inherently will save carbon. Nuria has calculated that the existing buildings, constructing the equivalent existing building, would cause 900 tons of CO2 emission. This is the roughly the CO2 emission of about 100 people in the UK for a year. So it's quite a lot. And that decision of keeping existing buildings is a good way to save CO2 emissions. In addition to this, uh, Nuria has designed a project which manages rainwater and puts rainwater back into the ground. This is really important when we see that rainfalls are becoming more and more irregular and less predictable. In addition, she is designing, um, she's introduced green roof and designing a site which is very green and that also helps with issues of overheating and heat waves during the summer by providing a green island on their site. She is adding insulation to the existing building. This is really important because existing buildings very often are not very energy efficient. They may use a lot of heating and just simply by adding insulation, we help re reducing CO2 emissions. Another project by Nikas Rulma Aikau. Nick has designed a project which aims at providing outdoor and indoor recreational activities in Skopje, which is in North Macedonia. And the project includes many uh, sustainable and green features. For example, it uses uh, sustainable materials in this construction, and it also has green roofs, which enhance the ecology of the site. But the aspect of the project that I'd like to mention is how it tackles flooding. The site for the project is in an area which is already prone to flooding and it's very important to consider flooding as climate change uh, causes the increased occurrence of flooding in many areas and the way Nick has been looking at his project is that the site can be flooded and works with water while simultaneously forming a protecting barrier to the water. So we can see here how the site works when it is being flooded. Mohamed has designed a library and education space in Milan and this project is designed uh, with the use of timber. Uh, timber is a very sustainable material and also has very low carbon emission because trees absorb CO2 when they grow and consequently even taking into account the manufacture of the materials that are going to be used in the building, overall the impact of timber can be negative in terms of CO2 at the point where it arrives on site due to the absorption of CO2 by the tree during its life. In addition, Mohamed has considered how the building responds to solar gain. This is a very important thing. Effectively, the building is shaded during the summer uh, and uh, the sun is kept as much as possible outside the building by the use of external shading and blinds. But during the, the winter, the sun can enter the building and uh, this is very good because it uh, reduces the amount of heating that's required for the building. And of course, Mohammed is considered insulation. Insulation is always extremely important when we're talking about energy efficiency and also protecting the building from the heat gains and the sun. Jorgos uh, has designed a youth club in Skopje in North Macedonia. The project has been essentially designed to tackle air pollution. But here I'm going to talk about how uh, Jorgos has looked at uh, reducing the impact on climate change through his design. So the student has taken great care in selecting materials that have low embodied energy. This means that the materials used are local, 
and their manufacture and transport doesn't use a lot of energy. So he's using, for example, uh, natural materials such as hempcrete, which are produced locally, uh, and therefore their uh, transport doesn't cause CO2 emission. In addition, he's done very, something very interesting, which is he looked at the idea of refurbished homes um, with additional insulation from hempcrete. This is very important because we know that a lot of the buildings that we occupy are existing buildings. So it's very important that we consider how to refurbish this building, these buildings and how to ensure that they will produce less CO2 through their heating. Evelina has looked at uh, designing an urban farm in Athens. Um, so this is a project which is providing a green, an island of greenery and an island of coolness in this very hot city, which also suffers from the urban heat island effect, which means that the city is warmer than its surrounding areas. So the greenery helps through the evaporation of water create an island of coolness. In addition, Evelina has looked at how to provide cooling to the building through the use of natural ventilation. So effectively, she's using an arrow plan and that helps uh, naturally ventilating the building. But also she's using materials which have high thermal mass. Uh, what this is, is that the materials absorb the heat during the day and during the night, the buildings can be flushed, uh, they can be naturally ventilated and this air can pick up the heat from the thermal mass, from these materials, um, and release it to the outside. So the materials that she's using are stone, for example, and stone has this property of uh, absorbing the heat during the day and releasing it in the air when the air is cooler at night. Finally, No Sabrina has designed uh, an education project which provides general and vocational education. Also, this is a project in London. Um, these projects again use timber as the main material um, and also uh, as a way to ensure that there's less waste produced on site. An interesting aspect of her de design and idea is that she's using asset tagging. This means that the individual parts of the building have a tag which can be scanned. And this uh, will provide a link to information about this material and about this building part and about how it's been made, transported, and very importantly, full details on how it can be repaired, replaced, or recycled. Uh, this approach contributes to uh, a circular economy and extends the life of the materials and of the building, therefore reducing CO2 emissions of the building's life cycle. To conclude, I would like to invite you to join the architecture courses at the UER. We offer undergraduate courses such as a degree in architecture, architectural design and technology, and interior design. And we also offer postgraduate courses such as our Masters in Architecture uh, and AMAs in Architecture and Urbanism, Landscape Architecture and Interior Design. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you at the UEL very soon.